Frontier Regional School District School Committee meeting to order at 7 o'clock. Oh, yeah, all right. And then first order of business is uh, to review and approve the minutes uh, for March 5th, March 7th, and April 9th. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It sounds like you guys have been busy. 
I know there has been some response, there's been some talk about what's happening, maybe what were some of the protocols in place before, maybe some things that have changed. But I just want to say, like, as a parent on the outside of the situation, like, one thing that has kind of come across is, and I don't mean this to be like hypercritical or in any way like personal, but we have a very kind of male-centric administrative team and that might be in some way, there's maybe some identity focus with that, but I felt a lack of care about what has happened, a lack of continuance of care. And I know we have a fine line between protecting our students and pushing the issue too far in a way that they may be even more vulnerable, and also looking at how our whole community is responding in a caring way to crisis situations, and also a climate in which a crisis could happen like this. So I just like, for me, I need to put out there, kind of in a clear way, the care must be a line item in policy and how we respond to any crisis on our campus. Care must be modeled from our administrative team First and foremost, everyone should feel cared for and no one should feel afraid to be here. And there are still students in the building who are afraid. So you should know that moving forward that probably more care needs to happen right now. That's me, thank you. Thank you. big success. It was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, we're hoping to expand it to the middle school next year. I got to teach Greek dancing, which was awesome. So um, next year, hopefully, school committee, if you want to come and join us, it'd be great. Uh, the art showcase did happen on May 1st. I want to do a big thank you to Jack Russell, uh, our art department chair, uh, Max Cheryl as well for helping put that together. It was a wonderful day. Music, uh, theater, um, uh, the visual arts, uh, it, was, it really does a great job of showcasing. Uh, all of the, the range of talent that we have here in the building. Um, I also want to highlight, so um, our, uh, our ELA department chair, Lynette Varnon, um, she coordinated a trip. Uh, so our AP literature and creative writing students were invited to Smith uh, to hear US poet laureate uh, Ada Limon read, read. So I think that, that I think that that's wonderful to be able to, to have you know, a, poor, a poet laureate, to be able to go see a poet laureate. Um, I want to thank Lynette for giving our students the uh, opportunity to do that. Um, we just had the, uh, the prom a couple weeks ago at the park. I want to thank our 11th grade class advisor, Beth Smith, for putting that together. Uh, it, was a great, it was a great night. Um, the spring play, as Patrice mentioned, Reckless is happening this coming weekend. Thank you to John Dodonna for all of his hard work on that. Uh, and a couple other fun things that are happening now. MCAS is, we're in the middle of MCAS season, which is going on. Um, something very important that's happening, May 23rd is Step Up Day. So May 23rd, Step Up Day is when the sixth grade, the, uh, all the new seventh grade, upcoming seventh grade students come, uh, they visit, they get uh, a tour of the building, uh, they get to um, see all of the extracurricular activities that are available for them, uh, as well as the athletics that are available for them. And believe it or not, the most exciting thing that they get to do all day is they get to eat lunch in the cafeteria, which they absolutely love. So we're doing that as well. Um, class night is on the 29th and graduation's on the 31st. So um, early graduation this year, uh, and we're hopeful for good weather, and yes, so thank you. Thank you, Patrice. <laughs>
expert updates. Let's shake it up a little bit. Are we doing the, are we going to do the okay. uploading? Uh, the slide, that slide is now first. Oh, all right. Let's do that first, and then we'll do, the, yeah. we'll do this next. That's yeah. okay. It's yeah, just yeah. a one slide. Nope, that's so, fine. Yeah. So I know this was on your agenda um, last time that you met the cultural studies graduation requirement. So we're putting forth a proposal to require students starting with this year's eighth grade class as, as they move into ninth grade uh, to be required to, required to take a two and a half credit um, course that would fulfill a cultural studies requirement. As all of you know, we've been working on anti-racism, equity, inclusion for the last four years uh, through professional development of faculty and staff. And we really want to bring that forward also to our students. And we're doing that in two ways. One um, is the Global Studies Pathway, which is an opportunity for students that are particularly interested in studying um, global and culture to be able to do a pathway and do an internship with that program. The second way, um, and this would require a school committee vote, is through our uh, two and a half credit requirement that would require all students to take a course and you can see some of the courses that would qualify for that up here. Uh, they can certainly take more than two and a half credits. Some of these courses are more than two and a half credits, uh, but it'd be a way to, to have all students participate in a course like this. So are all of those courses are plan to be on like what they can choose from starting next year? Uh, so many of them are in place already. Mm -hmm. um, we're offering the courses on a rotating basis, so right. they're not all offered every year because um, we don't have that kind of we, we don't teachers have that yet. Many students fill up many classes every yep. year, uh, so we rotate through. But yes, okay. they're all on a cycle to be offered. For example, Asian Studies is not being offered next year, but the first time that will be offered is the year after. So some of them are on a two-year cycle. We are adding new ones, so, a, so Asian Studies will be new, um, Latin American Studies is going to be offered for the first time next year, um, Latin, let's see, activism, African, AP African American Studies is being offered for the first time next year, um, yes, yeah, so some of them are, and they'll rotate through. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. So that kind of answers the question on the teaching and construction side is kind of fitting smoothly into the program of studies on the student side, is the additional two and a half credits going to put an undue burden on students, or will that fit smoothly? It, it will fit nicely, because they already have extra wiggle room that is kind of grace credits, um, so they should be able to fit this in pretty easily. And that would jeopardizing their ability to graduate. They can still, I believe, and which I tell you all here, they still believe that you get out of semester courses up here even though a lot of them would cover content that we would be considering relevant uh, for this type of work but we wanted this to be kind of a unique piece that students were having to look at and consider and choose Thank 
Can you hear us? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Can we for an introduction? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. I think this makes sense to roll right in. Um, you, George, and Scott, you guys are all going to uh, give an update on the okay. emotional. Yeah. So we um, came, Laura and I came to the Joint School Committee meeting last month and presented on professional development. And there were some questions that came up during that presentation that we didn't have our full slide deck and information to really be able to respond to. I also didn't have my colleagues. My colleagues with me. So we're all here tonight to kind of give you an update on what's been happening at Frontier, um, particularly around the area of social emotional learning and some of our plans that we have for future curriculum pieces. Next slide. Um, so just as a reminder, um, we did a PD overview um, in April. We've got some more details filled in because this is the time of the year that we're trying to book these presenters and get them in place. Um, I still have an email out to Sarah Ward. Uh, but we're looking to do a heavy focus on executive functioning. Um, we found that students lost a lot during the pandemic and they're really needing a boost. And so we're gonna do a concentrated effort, hopefully with Sarah Ward, um, to bring that into being. Restorative practices, we've been doing that all along. Um, we're going to do that with a new twist and bring in Brave Schools, which uh, Scott will speak to at the end of the presentation. Um, Lynn Lyons um, does a lot with anxiety. And we also, we do have her booked we managed to also book her the evening before on November 13th, and I'm gonna put that out there loud and clear for families that are listening. Um, we will be doing a parent presentation with her. She is excellent. She's one of the top presenters in this area, um, and I think people will really enjoy her. Um, that will be followed the next day on November 14th with a Frontier presentation with Lynn Lyons, and then she'll be returning back in January to do an elementary uh, presentation for our elementary faculty. So that will be a district-wide presentation. Um, we'll continue to um, examine microaggressions. Uh, Translate Gender has come in before, and we'll have them in again. And then um, unrelated but related is we'll be doing ongoing curriculum work, and we're looking at PLC and data examination, and that really relates to our equity work also because we're gonna get that new uh, software system. So just uh, to keep people abreast of some of the, some of the um, uh, PD that administration has either taken part in this over, the, over this past year or will be taking part in. So we did an inclusive hiring practices PD. That was all the district administration did that with Dr. Lisa Toulousen. Uh, that was incredibly helpful and it was really, it was, it was really uh, inspiring. We are, we're doing, uh, we've got revised guidance on Title IX reporting and actually the, all the, uh, the district admin is also gonna be doing, uh, this month we're gonna be all be, gonna be doing, redoing training for on Title IX and also Title VII. And every other week we do roundtable conversations. We have our annual FERCOG health, uh, annual health survey, um, which is based on the Franklin Regional Council, Council of Governments does, does a survey about um, basically uh, school climate and, and uh, safety and things like that. So we examine that. We have ESPERT that happens every year in grades seven and nine, which basically, uh, which basically screens students for substance, substance uh, uh, triggers. And so we, we look at that and, and we make decisions based on that, that uh, not just with our, for our health classes, but uh, as administrators as well. Uh, next slide. So currently some of our school initiatives, so we've updated our website. Uh, there's an increased visibility of the Title IX coordinator now, uh, who's Karen Ferrandino. Uh, we're beta testing a new incident online reporting tool, uh, which uh, we're in the process of, like I said, we're beta testing it right now. Uh, we are exploring a digital pass system. So there is a, so we're hoping to begin a pilot this year with a small group of teachers, uh, and we've been discussing that with department chairs as well. Uh, we're going to be updating both our faculty and our student handbooks this summer. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're basically planning on adding uh, an additional mental health counselor uh, part-time for the 24-25 school year. Uh, we're continuing to do our civics engagement projects in grades 8 and 12, which are incredibly, uh, they're really, they help bolster sort of, I would say, a lot of what's happening in the school in terms of building community. Um, and we're, we're actually in the process now of discussing with our arts department, a school-wide cultural and arts sort of integration. 
So their department chair and uh, Mr. Sherrill have been talking about that, and they really want to sort of bring that to preeminence as well within the building. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to our department chairs. We were able to run the slideshow through our department chairs this afternoon, and they were able to add to this also. So. Um, a thank you to all of them for participating and helping us out. Um, so just some curriculum updates, uh, which we have gone over before, but uh, we're continuing to include uh, grade appropriate lessons uh, for all of our emotional wellness, uh, sexuality, consent. Uh, we have the, the One Love guest speaker programming. Um, they're coming in and working with us uh, quite frequently. And then we're looking um, this summer, uh, the counselors are going together. We are hiring a new um, counselor that's coming to Frontier. Um, she's already been hired. I think she signed her contract. Um, psychologist. Psychologist, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, and they're going to be looking at resources that we can use to do social emotional learning. We're gonna start in the middle school. Um, and the idea would be that the counselors and psychologists would actually be delivering that curriculum to middle school. Um, as a way of integrating it in um, to the programming, and then we're going to expand up to high school after we get it up and running in middle school. I'll speak to the next two slides because I'm directly involved in both of them. Um, since January, um, myself and Grant Pialik and two mentors that uh, are attached to Mentoring the Manhood, uh, Rob and Sam, have been meeting with some eighth grade boys that we've had an eighth grade team help identify uh, to really focus on modeling um, and connecting to their social and emotional processes and <clears throat> exploring vulnerabilities. And I feel that this you know, 15 week session has been going very well. Uh, we've developed some really good relationships and we are looking for next year. Um, our capacity is probably gonna stay with the four mentors um, but we're going to expand our time, continue with a different group of these current eighth graders that's through ninth grade, um, and then bring in a new group of eighth graders um, and continue that work. The peer mentoring group is something we've been doing for at least two years now, um, really getting a lot of stuff off the ground last year in terms of training them. And these are high school students who we asked the faculty to identify um, who could help us out by bringing some um, group work to middle school. Uh, we've been involved with the Brave Schools Project um, for over a year now. We started last March. And that's run through the Corona Center for Peace Studies. And really what we wanted to do with that is bring them on board. They had a lot of grant uh, money to provide us with our practices training and really kind of train up our, our uh, high school students to begin circle work with our middle school. And this past semester, they've been doing weekly sessions with them. Our, our, our very last session is tomorrow um, with our high school students going in. And this year's focus, based on a student survey, was microaggressions. And next year, um, we're going to shift our focus to in consent and uh, healthy relationships by using one love. Um, and of course, continuing our grade school's relationship. Um, what we're gonna do to, to expand this and, and make it um, more of a requirement um, is that all of our sports captains and any student leader, student council, anyone involved, um, I, I'm really appreciative of, of uh, advisors like John Dodonna who has I, I assigned captains to his theater group, they're coming. So anyone who's been identified as a captain or a student leader, all of our various clubs, sports or groups or activities do mandatory training. Um, in order to be a captain, they have to uh, give this to the school. And what I'm really, um, really happy about is now that we have a full-time athletic director, he's also gonna help me by training our coaches who are outside of the building to help support this work. Um, when we have identified students who are leaders, um, and you know, it's gonna be okay if, 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 if they wanna opt out, they don't have to be a captain, no hard feelings, but this is gonna be a requirement for them. 
we're starting with that. I've got a full list all ready to go for next year's leadership. June 3rd and 4th, um, we're doing a two-day One Love uh, training on uh, consent and health relationships for the student leaders to gain that knowledge and gain um, the skill set to deliver this next year as we move through. We want to we want to start in the fall doing circle work. Uh, this year, what we had to do is spend this past fall building skill set, building capacity of our student leaders before we started this, the circle work. Um, so we want to just get started sooner next year than that in the fall. So are all those student leaders um, selected, elected, dependent team or theater by the end of this year? The flip, so obviously the fall sports yeah. are already there. But yeah. winter sports, spring sports? Yep. Well, um, uh, we year. asked all the coaches um, to give us, and pretty much everyone, had a good idea of who next year's leadership was going to be. Um, so that was that was actually easy to do. Um, and what we found too, um, myself, Grant, Melissa Strokey, and Kate Blair, who oversee the peer mentoring group, is there is a lot of overlap. We've got some students here who are wearing a lot of hats already. So their name showed up a lot on the list. So um, and, and when you when, when we were cross referencing the list, it was. It was actually cool to see. We've got a lot of students who are doing a lot of things. Um, and I know this feels like we're adding you know, to the, this to their place, but we have some high flyers in this building that are willing to do the work. So I'm happy about that. Um, George, I have two questions. Could you describe a little bit more detail the online reporting system and then the, how the digital pass system that's so my right question. Now, so the online reporting system right now, like I said, it's just we're just starting to test it. I know that we've been working on a team more about this, put something together, just put a form together that we basically for people can go in on this right? and they can they can fill it out. Uh, and we're basically we're, we're, right now we're testing it to make sure that it gets to the appropriate person, uh, but then it's not going to talk about the best way to do So I'm sure that it's working on That would be like on the school website. Yeah. I know this is unorthodox, but can I insert just briefly? So, uh, uh, yeah, can I ask it? Is it beta like it's not live? No, it's live. Okay, that's what I was going to say. I, uh, I went on there and it, it looks like it's, it's live. No, so it's, it's not live supposed to be works, live. Yeah. The, I think it's live and it works, but one thing is we were talking with one of our consultants about trying to make it more in a, more, in a better with rearrange the whole website to kind of find it so you can find it easier if you're in a place of distress to find it. Two clicks in is kind of too much. They want to, want to bring it up front. But right now, the uh, reporting line links are live, um, and they do get reported to you. Uh, right now, they, they come to me. I have to put them out. And that's what we have to fix with the system. Where they think they'll get the right system. I'm not an IT person, so I probably use the word beta correctly. Yeah, that, no, that, I don't, yeah, yeah. that's fine. I, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and the passes. So, right now, we're exploring how to use. So, basically, um, so some of our teachers found a uh, company that does online passes, and they do it with Chromebooks. So they're exploring, so basically we're also in discussion with IT uh, to find a way basically to just try to make it work, to see if we can give it a shot, to have a small group of middle school teachers, because uh, they're really excited to try it. Um, and basically it would allow, for, so basically what they're telling us to do is it would allow for teachers to see what students are out, not just their own students, but other students as well. They'd be able to see how often students Day, so if they wanted to limit the number of passes, they could things like that. Um, and also, so like we're, like I said, we're just, we're exploring, we're hoping to get up and running and then do a trial uh, for the end. So, yes. so the digital part is more for teacher, like admin, like keeping track, not yes. so much the kids to be like, I have to go to the bathroom, and then the teacher gets a flash on their screen and they just go. Okay.
suggestion, like if there were QR codes in the bathrooms for students to uh, report on a, it, to queue in on a QR code, that's like a really easy way for students to anonymously report things and that might be something that would like promote uh, kids doing that. So just throwing that in the mix. Right now, like, 
I got a lot of talks in there and his capacity in the middle school. We want to expand his work and the peer mentoring group into each year slowly. Like we want to go to ninth grade and then from there we want to expand further into the high school. I, I'm following you, I yeah. apologize. Um, a lot of that is going to have to also come with the PD that we're doing with Brave Schools for our high school faculty to be able to do group work as well. Um, right now it's really just kind of our middle school that we've had trained um, that have run groups um, with grants help. Our high school teachers need to connect with them. Yeah. And I think some of this kind of came up in the professional development from last time, it seemed like there were some more, and I don't know, maybe there are user-friendly tools that are in the middle school and high school level too, but it seemed like there were kind of clear, concrete tools that were given to teachers to help with implementing some of these plans. Like facilitation, facilitation tools. And so I think that one of the things that stood out is that it sounds like this is clear, in a, in a way that makes it perhaps easier to implement. And it seemed like as we moved up that maybe we lost a little bit of that and maybe we have some of that at the middle school level, but then it, it, it might not, it might be a little more diluted at the high school. And I think that that would probably help to address some of this divide that I think happens when we talk about policy and we talk about training and then we have day-to-day -day life. And like, how do we translate those things and make them really good, accessible tools, not just for teachers, but also for the students and for parents, so that everybody knows how this plan and this training translates into how you support your day-to-day -day life in this community. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say it sounds like there's a lot of work that's happening over the summer and reviewing communication yeah, and policies. Yeah, I've to that too. Um, so. The Corona Center hired with their grant work, um, folks from Amherst College have a fantastic um, historic practices. Um, they, they do a great presentation and a great PD. Uh, we sent some of our student leaders to Amherst High School uh, in March and spent the day there with these trainers. Liked them so much, got a great report from Melissa uh, and Grant. That's who we're going to be bringing in in the fall. And they have a very well, um, easy to use, scripted protocol for how to run circles um, and do that. And that's what I think, you know, when we speak about uh, giving tools to high school teachers, that's what that's what will work. Um, and is there a way that we can bridge that out to here's the high school teachers' tools, but also kids, here's your here's your quick reference and parents. Here's what your kids got as a quick reference so that you know the tools that they have yeah. to yeah. when these issues come up. Yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm feeling very confident in, in that work. And um, the uh, specific trainer who um, worked with our kids at Amherst High School um, is, able, is going to be able to work with us. So uh, they, they, our, our team really felt that that was a very practical, user friendly approach um, that we're excited to expand.
you may not have a teacher who is right, right. Yeah, teacher teacher who's teacher running that. Yeah, yeah. Where I, that, uh, there's got to be some way to get them some tools and training to do with this. Yes, it sounds like that's where there's the most need. So it's going to be, um, well, we're going to have to work out the, this is one of the difficulties, and we kind of talked about that briefly at that meeting, um, that it's one of the problems we have, is that we have, in the fall season, we have teams down early, we have teams here, um, we have teams on the road. Um, there are some teams that require to have a trainer on site for games. Um, and so we're going to have to do some sort of system where um, students can get, you know, training, done at the end of the school day prior to their sports um, you know, practices begin, or if they're unable to participate in practice because of an injury, that there'll be some trainer hours, and then the trainer would also then have to attend some games. There will be, um, we'll have to have a discussion with the athletic director, because I'm going to imagine the athletic director is going to oversee this, um, where the priority goes, right? And so whenever you have to make a priority, it's going to be a question about why that priority was done, but, you know, does it, does the athletic trainer go to the field hockey game or to the boys' soccer game down early? You know what I mean? Um, that kind of thing. And can we call someone? Can they be mobile to come up to or go down to? Should you know that be that kind of thing? So it will not be 100% coverage, but it will be. I think more importantly, the I guess you could say clinic hours. If you roll your ankle the day before, um, you know, there could be some general assessment there and. Um, not just treatment, but these are the strengthening exercises when you start working on it to loosen your ankle right now. So it's standard hours though in yeah. the contract for 1,200 hours. So over the 10 months, it's 120 hours a month. You know, we probably average, what, 20, 22 school days, maybe 23 school days in a month. And there's not games on every single day. There's practices, most of those, but breaks in between seasons. Some teams don't participate in you know, tournaments. So you can also pay for additional time. They have that in here as well. If you need more hours, so, that they're willing to to give us more. And will they do the preseason in August? Start date is will be would be based on the contract. So I imagine we would try to get that straight out of you know sort of, sort of pre once the school season starts. Right. Like the preseason right. preseason right. 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 Which probably works out in the wash if you think about it. we start late August and end mid to late June, so that actually you know the tenth month is sort of split between the beginning and end of the sports seasons. The other things that does talk about is the requirement to be at football games 
um, and I think it mentions wrestling as well. Um, and then it talks about a lot of different things, like helping you stock your supply closets to make sure that you have proper materials, checking in with your athletic director, you know, assessing injuries, things like that. It's pretty comprehensive. It might have to say personal um, it, it's through Mass General. They, I believe they try to get the same person, but they are also in charge of getting a substitute and, okay. and or you oversight student trainers. They may be actually using some student trainers as well on site, but that would all be, again, um, that's the administrative stuff that we'll oversee to make sure that we proper people. And we guess the health benefits come from Mass General, not from us? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So just straight up that salary. Yep, it's contracted services. The people are employed by Mass General. And it, I mean, I, I know say it was, you know, not in here as I imagine that we're going to have to have supply items, and that's going to be a few thousand dollars. I mean, again, I don't think it's going to break the bank. Um, so, you know, we'll report back what the overall cost was. It is to go into year two as we will get by. Things great. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, it seems like. We're able to cover costs for one year, then we can reevaluate next year. But that would have to happen probably like January, February of the budget. So we're going to roll out the budget and we'll we'll put it in the budget to start the next school year. We just don't want to have a reoccurring expense on school choice, um, you know, without having discussed. We could decide to use school choice again for that for that item. And that would be the discussion. But it's, uh, Shelley kind of is that kind of. Very particular, but you don't, you know, you don't want to have recurring expenses on that, um, especially something like this. I think, um, but you, you know, as long as you're talking about it, just, just, just assume that that's going to start. The only thing I, I, I'm looking at or thinking about is, it's like a, it's a cost benefit versus the liability of the student there. Is there any major appropriate amount of course not? But is there any? data that we can use to make the judgment next year on how often the person is used or how many instances they have. Is there any empirical evidence that we could try to drive our decision? Not, not we, could, yeah, we could try to put something together to get kind of hard data about how much we I mean, there probably should be some kind yeah. of log. Like, I don't think they've thought about all these. Yeah. 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 From coaches, if there is an official injury, so that will get moved into the process. But I think it's really good. Yeah. 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 I guess also, uh, if we have an injury report already, we have a log that we can use to compare pre and post. Um, I don't know what the nurses keep. I send them off to the insurance and then they get shredded in my office. So, <laughs> so yeah, but I think um, there's a couple of, one thing I want to correct what you said is that this is not going to be the treatment of severe injury on moment. I mean, that's where EMTs will be called or they're going to be handed over their parents to go and see their medical provider. It doesn't replace that. It is to um, the ongoing injuries that our athletes have, preventative maintenance of you know, minor injury that you know, was, you know, I think uh, a school member even talked about it that um, could help work with the you know, PT to get a child back to, you know, you know to play again and that kind of stuff. But they do um, like concussion, like the be able concussion, to concussion, definitely concussion, more, like, yeah, assessment you know, of concussion. Hurt, they would have been able to say, oh, you need to go to the hospital right yeah. now. As yes, as yes, that stuff would happen, I'm sorry. But I just meant to say yeah. like, you know, if someone, was, if someone there. was to break their, <laughs> break their leg or something like that, they, yeah. they're not treating, they're, they'll stabilize for the proper treatment. I think maybe that was obvious. So what you are actually um, voting tonight is um, directing us to um, enter contract. Um, well, I, I, I do the contract work on this. You're just approving the funding from school choice of you want to round that up. 50, yeah, and then I'm in case we need okay. extra hours. You know? Like 
the contract, the initial contract would be 66 56, but assessing whether or not you need more time would be your So, all right, so you would be making a vote to um, approve. approve the funding toward an athletic trainer using school choice for the 24 25 school year. Can I ask if there's warning in there for how, what if things work out and we've got funding for it this year, but something happens and we can't fulfill the entire for three years, what's the penalty for popping out of the contract early? Right, I, I, we're going to have to add separation. There's a payment scale and fees that's been almost mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of my, my role in that to do it. Where would we use school choice? Where is this roughly being used for school choice? Um, so I actually think we're going to be able to capture enough savings from this year's budget savings, those salaries that I talked about earlier from unpaid leave of absence or personnel changes that we can bank that in school choice to cover it next year so it won't actually eat into our balance.
the addition of solar. But let's say we find out solar is not feasible on this roof or what have you, but you know, we got our, we're forced to put solar and we can't make it happen. Other hand, but we will be looking into it because we're promising to look at energy savings. So we made a motion to So I did sign my superintendent's report. Um, just so you know, just uh, and also just timing-wise, the new federal Title IX guidance came out um, during last month. Um, we are bringing in our um, one of our attorneys we work with to do a training on Title IX. That was kind of brought up earlier. But I also in this um, did a attached a memo from Mike Long from the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, who does a nice job of kind of explaining you know where the Title IX changes are. As it affects high schools, um, or not high school, K 12. Um, so I, I did throw that in there as well. The other thing, uh, this thing's rather overbroad, the other thing, uh, we did, um, in collaboration with David Thiel, um, who's a consultant, to revamp our uh, family, student family handbooks. The, uh, one of the big things that we talked about with him is that our handbooks lack um, the ability to find information easily and then. <laughs> 
all the different links that are connected to resources in our handbooks aren't connected through. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be doing there uh, to kind of get those up to modern day uh, use level. Our policy subcommittee um, last meeting did not have a quorum. And now we're in the process of changeover of um, with committees reorganizing this next month, and then um, we have elections in. Um, well, we actually, please elect not been elected, but so realistically, I think the policy subcommittee is going to kick off um, the next school year. We do have one whole section left of policy to go through, um, and there's a few other outliers that we have pulled out to kind of go through as well. So there's still work to be done in that. Yes, possibly go to the first reading in June, um, or it may just be September, but it's, it'll be close enough for the start of the school year to get that in place. So um, I was really happy that the um, Olivia was there too. It was just, it was just a good yeah, thing. <laughs> Can I ask a question off of that? We had talked about this, I don't know how long ago, um, about a survey of students at the end of the year. Do you remember this? Um, I think it was off of the anti-racism and equity work to, to see kind of where things are going culturally because we, we kind of, you know, in terms of the, the culture of the school and how folks are feeling, you know. And I think that one of the things that we talked about was that it was difficult to get them back once they go off to college. Oh, and do you remember, yeah, do you remember? I just wasn't sure if there was any work circling back on that. <laughs> so you want, well, and we have to be safe, but the creation of an exit survey for graduates? That is what we had talked about. And I don't know where we left it, to be honest with you. I know we talked about a lot of the, the difficulties in getting those done, but I wasn't sure. Where that landed on who's task for and take through notes and figure out where that landed, but I think that would be helpful to circle back out and we'll stick that on the next agenda. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think that that's been kind of clear and has come up in the professional development and in other things. So getting the perspective of the students is really helpful. Guide the work 
Um, the next area was regarding um, the state education aid update. Um, right now, um, it's gone through, the, the budget is done, if you've been following it or not. This is a quick, not a quick summary, it's a full page summary of where everything is. I won't read through the whole thing, but basically it is in front of the Senate right now. Um, Senate, the Senate did come back and move um, rural aid back to 50 million. That's probably the most important thing that we're keeping an eye on. They are talking about the, um, the Chapter 70 numbers also held from the House, which is at 104 per student. It doesn't affect us very much. It's only you know, $20,000 or so much for Frontier, um, whereas rural aid is close to 200,000. And so when we're talking about moving different monies around, and if they don't, so the, the three pots to watch as they discuss and negotiate with Baltic is that your price per student, which we don't get, as they, they're gonna have to really move that up to hundreds different in order for it to make an impact on our budget. Um, we keep an eye on rural aid, and then you have to keep an eye on transportation. So if they you know, raise rural aid but lower trans regional transportation, it can be a wash for us. So we can be kind of show you our constantly looking at those three numbers. How do they add up, and what's our net gain and loss? So, um, but right now there are, I uh, did do a cut and paste of what is from the, again, from the Association of School Superintendents, what's right now as bills that have been um, sent out um, to increase funding in the different areas. Um, again, rural aid and regional transportation are the two areas, um, as you can see, the different um, amendments that, and who put them forward and such. And then the last part, I won't read through all of them, but we do have a lot of capital projects, and if you kind of quickly add up, it's you know, millions of dollars worth of capital projects that are underway right now across the district and going into the summer. So you can kind of see that so, um, all the different things are happening in each school. And right now, your budget is passed by both Deerfield and Sunderland, and both Conway and Waitley's meetings are in June, so we won't know well until June if we have to pass budget. Am I anticipating any problems? Okay. Okay.